This morning's first reading is from the Hebrew Bible, Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2, and 9 through 16. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The gospel lesson is from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil then led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he, let him, he left him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. culture and in mainstream Christianity, we think of wilderness in negative terms. We think it's about when you are lost or wandering in a strange and bewildering settings 
or it's a place where we feel everything is stagnant. No one seeks to go there. No. Usually we are thrust into it. In short, it's thought of uh, as a place of judgment, exile, and isolation. Therefore, when we read the story about Jesus in the wilderness, we think it as a time of suffering and pain. And of course, fasting food and water for 40 days, that's not very comfortable. I can't imagine doing that. However, a season of wilderness is not always negative. In the Hebrew Bible, we find stories related to the wilderness that isn't, that aren't about suffering and punishment only. Many of them relay themes of purification, revelation, healing, renewal, comfort, and mainly transformation. And we also see these themes in today's story. It's not just about the temptation of Christ. It, com it contains a more complex process that transforms Jesus of Nazareth to Messiah, the Son of God. By studying it, we gain greater understanding of our own wilderness experiences. Remember the times when you felt totally forsaken, when you felt lost, and wonder, where the heck am I? During wilderness seasons, when we're there, how many times you sense the burden of the moments on your shoulders? You thought you needed to overcome temptations, endure str stress, and, and privation, and only then you could get out of the wilderness. That's what you thought. Well, I read a really touching novel that relates to wilderness experiences. The protagonist of the book, Kaya, and the protagonist of the book, where the crowd that sings, the main heroine, Kaya, endured a life of loneliness. Her house literally was in the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in the vast marshland of North Carolina. Because her father was a violent man, all her siblings had to run away. Eventually, her mother had to leave her also because her father almost killed her. When it was just her and him, the father also left her. So at the age of 10, she had to fend for herself. Well, somehow, she is befriended by a kind young man, Tate. He taught, he taught her how to read and supplied her with books and educational material. They got involved romantically, but he had to leave for college and promised to come back for her. However, he never came back. He didn't even say goodbye to let her know that he was going away for good. The question that nagged Kaya throughout the story is, why is she all alone? Why did her mother leave her and never, never came back for her? And why did Tate abandon her even though he seemed so kind and cared for her? So she decided not to trust anyone. At that point in the story, she accepted her wilderness as a lonely experience full of heartache and pain. Going back to our story with Jesus, many of us read the story of Jesus in the wilderness in the framework of temptation versus resistance opposition. Because the ancient Israelites in the wilderness during the time of Exodus failed these basics of trusting, honoring, and humbly depending on God. So Jesus had to overcome them. The core of the story tells us that Jesus is the Messiah that overcame temptations that we cannot. But there are other elements in the stories that I want to share. The first one is that wilderness experience, even though it might be terrible in the beginning, it purifies and transforms us. The ancient Israelites Fleeing Egypt had to stay in the Sinai Desert for 40 years. During that time, only two people made the whole journey, Joshua and Caleb. By the time the nation of Israel came to the border 
on River Jordan, that was a complete new generation of people. And when we read the Exodus account, we're disappointed by the lack of faith and trust by the Israelites. And we might be tempted to fault and criticize them and try to avoid their behavior. However, the greater, story, greater point in that Exodus story is that during the time of, in the desert, we are transformed as a new person. In literature, it's called the wilderness ordeal, where the protagonist must travel through harsh environments or difficult period in order to become transformed. In the book I mentioned, the main character, Kaya, had to endure for years the wilderness experience of being alone, betrayed, forgotten, and slighted before, being un before she understanding herself, being transformed into a proud, independent woman. And as Christians, we think we're in the wilderness because the result of sin and failure. Well, that's not the case always. Here with Jesus, and, and, and in many literature and biographies, wilderness is part of life. That's what we always experience. The time we spent through the lockdowns of COVID was a wilderness experience for most of us. So let's look at the way the passage shows the transformation of Jesus. Now, Bill read until 13, and I should have read 14. I'm sorry about that. But after 13, verse 13, this is what it says in verse 14. It says, after the wilderness, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. A whole different person. Someone with power, authority, and eminence emerged out of the wilderness experience. This is a transformation story. And God, God will transform us through the wilderness. The second note is that the season in the wilderness accompanies spiritual revelation. For the temptations of Jesus... He th we think Jesus, we think his answer to Satan was ready-made. It's so obvious, right? It's in the Bible. Somehow he knew them all along. However, my take is that his response, or his responses, were formed out of his pain and suffering. When he was tempted to turn stone into bread, his response was, a person does not live by bread alone, but by, by every word that proceeds from God's mouth. That came, that revelation came out of his intense spiritual experience of fasting for 40 days. This is, was not an informational biblical knowledge. It was something that was revealed to him in the 40 days of fasting. My most memorable moments in ministry are the times when I have close encounters or when I get to know people in my parish that go through severe suffering. Debbie was a member of one of my previous parishes. She had terminal cancer. And after receiving chemotherapy, her doctors observed a rapid decline in her situation. So she, started, she decided to stop all treatment. And <clears throat> she was a very gracious person. Most people in this situation don't want to be seen. But she allowed me to come visit her about a month before she passed. When I saw her, I thought she would be in a dour mood. But no, but she seemed to radiate with this presence. She greeted, she greeted me with grace and warmth. We talked a bit, but I remember her sharing about the revelation of God, and she understood now the incredible love of God 
for all of us. And she said, as she was talking to me, she felt the love of God was surrounding her like a palpable cloud, just, just covering her all the time. And she said, you know what my regret is, Keith? I regret not loving as much as I've been loved by God during my lifetime. I regret not forgiving, holding on to resentments, and not rec reconciling with those who are estranged from me. In her ultimate wilderness experience, she was given so much revelations about the love of God. See, when you're in that difficult place, God reveals his revelation, his secrets, his mysteries to you. That leads to my third note. We receive divine comfort during seasons of wilderness. It's not recorded in Luke, that the, the, uh, Luke or Matthew that we read about the temptation or the 40 days in the wilderness, but it's recorded in a very short, in the book of Mark, they just give a very short um, description, and this is what it says. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and angels attended him. In other translations, it says angels ministered to him or served him. In other words, Jesus was not, was not alone. He was comforted and cared for by angels. Wow. He was in the wilderness. See, when Satan tempts him with the scripture, Jesus counters with, do not put Lord your God to the test. In short, Jesus was saying, don't doubt God's love. How did he come to this revelation? When he entered the wilderness, this was probably the central question that he had in his heart. What is God's love for me? Because before he entered, he was baptized, and the heaven opened and said, This is my son, whom, whom I love. I am perfectly happy, um, well pleased. But he knew he had to face Jerusalem, go to the cross. So one experience declares in the incredible love of God, while the other represents rejection, loneliness, and agony. So how does he reconcile the two? One psalm, probably, he probably, one psalm that was on his mind was Psalm 91, which we read today. And at the same time, he was probably reflecting on Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Through this time of wilderness, by being comforted by angels, Jesus understood that God loves him through the wilderness. There is no doubt. There's no need to doubt his love and care. He received God's love through that time. See, I remember those times, and we're probably going through some of it now. You think... You're all alone. You think that you've been abandoned. But when you look back in those days, you'll see clearly God's presence, his comfort, and his care for you during the very difficult times. In the novel where the crawdad sings, Kaya finds incredible re revelations about relationships. Through her loneliness, her appreciation for, for family, friends, and neighbors strengthens. She learns that betrayal is loathsome. Loyalty and faithfulness are foundations of love and relationships. Against that, the town people are very superficial. They hold on dearly to maintaining their facade and not entering into honest and trusting relationships. She received profound, profound truth about people, nature, and herself this, through this time of isolation. Her friend Tate now has graduated from college, was embarking on a PhD in proto 
zoology. And he wanted to apologize for Kaya for not saying goodbye. She doesn't accept her, his apology for a long time. However, while he was visiting, he noticed her drawings on seashells and feathers. And he asked if he could take them to, a, to publishers to make a book. Well, that works out. And she becomes a, a world-renowned illustrator and expert on swamp shells and wildlife. And, I, you know, the title kind of got me. I worked, I, Crawdad, I never heard of that. Have you ever heard of Crawdads? Right, right, you know, right. Crawdad is a regional word for crayfish or crawfish. A little lobster-like creatures that live in muddy fresh water. And I wasn't sure if these crayfish or crawfish could sing. So I looked it up. They could sing? Okay, I'm wrong, right? She's a smart one because the author is um, um, a PhD. The author of this book is a PhD in zoology, but we don't know, right? I didn't know. I looked it up. I didn't know, so please forget that right there. I think the point of the title, with respect to Kaya's story, is that when someone lives in a place society deems as dangerous or repulsive, well, then that experience of isolation and trials can purify and transform us. It transforms us into a person that was like a muddy creature, that, like craw crawfish, to a beautiful creature that flies through the blue, expensive sky to sing pure songs of joy. It could be. <laughs> but they do sing, as um, I was reminded. We're traveling through the season of wilderness of Lent. Also on another level, with a looming threat of greater conflict arising from Ukraine, we're also thrusted into a season of confusion and stress. However, I pray that through this season, you experience soul-changing purity. You go to another level of transformation and you receive daily divine spiritual revelations from God. And always, always be comforted by his grace. Let's pray. Oh God, you are our God. We seek you. Our souls thirst for you. Our flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So we have to look upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. Our lips will praise you. So we will bless you as long as we live. We will lift up our hands and call on your name. You comfort, refine, and transforms us through these desert journeys. Help us to trust and remain in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thanks for joining us. If you're interested in visiting us in person, we are at the corner of Liberty Meeting Court and Sugarland Road. Look forward to seeing you soon.